All right, we are live. Let's quickly start with the video that I have for everyone. we are live hello and welcome everyone this is uh, rashmi from design hill and your host for the day i hope everyone is doing great and staying safe i see a lot of people here a lot of people are responding where they are joining us from so welcome to the session everyone um, today we are going to talk about dim sum strategy bite sized tools to build stronger brand the event is brought to you by design hill which is the world's leading creative marketplace that caters to the creative needs of businesses and individuals alike who can source high quality designs and buy unique product uh, designs from professional designers from around the world today we have peter wilken with us uh, let me quickly introduce peter for everyone uh, so peter is a professional speaker a brand building specialist and an author he helps individuals and organization to think and act more creatively and build stronger brands he was the co-founder of one of the first specialist brand consultancies which is called the brand company and he worked with five of the world's top 10 brands including AIG Coca-Cola McDonald's PepsiCo Shell Unilever and many more across the wide spectrum of categories and cultures his book dim sum strategy bite sized tools to build stronger brands was published in late 2019 it shares a curated selection of over 40 of the most effective creative and strategic thinking tools as judged by clients from over 25 years in advertising brand consulting change management in an easy to digest format thank you so much peter for taking out the time and joining us uh, today uh, please go ahead and say hi to the audience hello everybody and thanks for that uh, very generous introduction rashmi that's very kind of you thank you so much peter once again so all right everyone uh, i see uh, everyone is super excited for today's session uh, before we move ahead i have a quick announcements uh, to make so you can take the screenshot of this session and put it on your instagram story use hashtag designer events tag designer dh and uh, wilkin.peter which is peter's instagram handle one lucky winner will have a chance to win a print shop gift card worth 50 dollars so make sure you do that also we will be providing certificates to all the attendees who stay with us till the end um, so make sure make sure you stick till the end also um, we will be sharing an exclusive coupon code with you using which you can get a 15% off on print shop and buy merchandise of your choice so stay tuned about that uh, so those were the few announcement that i have to had to make uh, before we start the session let's quickly look at what print shop by design hill is all about just give me a second The thing I love about filmmaking is that it's the thing I love about filmmaking is that it's every part of the process you have to invite and bring in a team of people to share your vision with. I love that you can have an idea, you can write a script, but in order to make any type of film, you need at least one to hundreds of other people. New in Jersey is a television show that I've been working on for the past year. I've always wanted to make New Jersey what Stephen King made Maine. and tell these really weird small stories in New Jersey. When you're pitching a show or a movie, it's really important to take that time and make what you're presenting feel real and authentic. I was looking for design materials that can help explain my vision and help brand what I'm trying to sell. So I used Design Hills logo maker and it was super easy. They asked me a couple questions, I answered them and then I picked from a handful of designs that I liked certain aesthetics about. and then 
Within a few seconds, I had tons of options to mix and match and choose from. It was really easy. When you're pitching a show, you don't always have your budget worked out. For me, this was an awesome option. Design Hills Logo Maker was really affordable, so I don't have to put a ton of money in and I get the assets that I need to make my job easier and more successful. In addition to the logo, they also offer things like t-shirts, business cards, and social media kits. I can honestly say that thanks to Design Hill, I now have the assets and the materials I need to go into a meeting and feel my best. All right, that was uh, uh, about Design Hill, and now we are all set to, to, to start the session. If you have any question, make sure you put up all your questions in the question section. We will take all the questions in the last 15 minutes of the session, so make sure you do that, and also respond to a few polls that we are going to roll out in between the session. So, Peter, we are all set. Over to you. Uh, kindly unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks again, Arashmi, and welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for making time to join us for this session. Um, I can see that we've got fantastic coverage and representation here, so I won't say good morning, although that's what it is in Vancouver from where I'm talking to you at the moment. I can see I've got some Canadian colleagues joining us, but it's a good evening for you in India, um, in Australia. I can see we've got people from the Philippines, from Nepal. Um, I hope you're all staying well, and I hope you get some good value out of this session. Um, uh, Rashmi, are you going to start uh, sharing the presentation now? Yes, let me do that. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Wonderful. So, Tim, some strategy. It took the aardvark or the anteater as it's better known by thousands of years to evolve a long snout and a sticky tongue to hunt ants from an ant nest it took chimpanzees considerably less time to work out that a stick could do exactly the same job so that we know that tools can dramatically accelerate solutions if you find the right tool and the right way to use it and we are all, as brand builders and business builders, looking for those magic strategic tools that make our jobs easier. Uh, and currently, in this pandemic world, and with so many challenges, we're facing unprecedented levels of change and uncertainty and complexity that makes finding the right illuminating tools even more useful. Um, but what I've tended to find is that you either try and either get sold somebody a, a, a strategic system or tool that is a panacea for everything uh, and and or you want to find that tool um, like a, a kind of multi-headed screwdriver they're never actually quite as efficient as the tailored tool to do the job um, things don't work like that there's no one size solution fits all uh, you need the right tools for the right job and yet at the same time it's useful to have the framework of a consistent easy to understand process and that's what the dim sum strategy approach basically is it's the flexibility to choose the right strategic tool for the right job in an agnostic way from a very broad toolbox uh, but within a framework the 4d's framework that makes it easy to understand and follow and i'm going to share with you uh, just a small selection of the 45 or 50 of best tools that uh, I put into the book, Dim Sum Strategy, that were put there because my clients, having worked with them for 30 years in advertising, change management, and brand consulting, told me it were the things that work best for them, uh, together with the, the strategic framework, framework that we developed as the brand company. So let's get into it. Um, you know, very quickly, uh, Rashmi told you about my background. My last corporate role was running um, BBDO across Asia Pacific out of Hong Kong. So I looked after their 14 markets and I spent four years with Burnett's before that doing the same thing for their Southeast Asia market out of Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. Um, and I had 11 years with Ogilvy, the University of Advertising um, based out of London and and, and Asia, Hong Kong, Manila, and other places. Uh, the beauty of that kind of world 
and the consulting world and brand consulting is that you get to work with a fantastic variety of the top blue chip brands. It's like a smorgasbord of different cultures and different solutions and problems. And the beauty of that is that you can see the constants in what makes great brands great and what tools are really working to be able to drive change within organizations. Uh, and that's what I'm going to try and share with you. Uh, just a couple of minutes so that you've got a context from where these tools came from and how the whole thing came together. A quick story about the brand company, um, yeah, uh, which I set up with two co-partners um, in 2002. Gosh, it's nearly 20 years ago, how time flies. Um, and we didn't know it then, but it, with hindsight, we were probably pioneering, the first pioneers in a brand new category of specialist brand consulting companies. Uh, and then with hindsight, uh, even though we were called a, a brand consulting company, actually what we were was a change management company from a brand perspective. And my two partners were um, the, the young entrepreneur of the year from Hong Kong, a guy called Ian Henry, who'd made himself a multi squillionaire with China.com and lost most of it um, by the age of 28. Uh, and a super smart marketing guy called James Stewart, who was the top marketing guy of the leading um, telco company uh, in Hong Kong at that time. And between us, the three of us, I came from my advertising background. And what we what we felt was or perceived was that hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars was being spent on what we called the superficial packaging of the brand. That is um, the visual identity, the design, if you like, and the advertising communications that I've just been spending 25 years doing. And don't get me wrong, that's not to say they're not important. They're hugely important, but not as important as the substance of the experience that those brands are delivering. Uh, so we thought that there was so much uh, knowledge vested in the strategic understanding of how to position brands and articulate them, but it was being used more on the superficial side than the uh, substantial side of changing the way in which brand experiences were created and driven through organization and through change. And we created this approach called brand-centered management, uh, which I'm going to share with you now. Um, but this was based on, let me just share with you this. Uh, this was one of the earliest premises that we worked on, which is very basic for any of you there uh, who are professional uh, um, brand builders. Uh, <clears throat> but also it's surprising I found how few people go back to some of the basics in order to be able to provide sophisticated solutions. Basically, there are five stages of, of brand building and, and unbranded is extraordinarily rare these days. It used to be things like rice and potatoes and paper and water, everything is branded now. Perhaps firewood at the, at the gasoline station or by the side of the road is the, one of the few unbranded things. Basic branding, basic identification, ownership, um, uh, brand differentiation now is really quite sophisticated in terms of color palettes and, and uh, uh, identities, fonts, basic brand language. And then brand personality, stage four and stage five is really where the value add was and where uh, the brand building profession made its money. And those were things like in the very old days, you know, your unique selling propositions. More importantly now, things like your brand DNA, which was the term which we actually um, coined. And I'll, I'll share with you a little bit more later. Uh, but very few were actually achieving what we call stage five, which is the brand at the company's heart, where it was intuitively informing everything that you had to do and say these kind of organizations never had to advertise for employees because they would come to them like evangelists and there are very very few of them and it's very difficult to actually achieve that status and stay there at that time perhaps apple was it um, apple is now probably on the way back down the curve it's very hard to stay uh, as the uh, innovative challenger when you're actually almost representing the establishment now so, but this is what we said. We said, use the strategic tools to be able to move up that value and get higher from stage four to stage five. And we developed brand-centered management along the premise of this, which is pure brand 
is what you wish to stand for in your most valuable customers' minds, and it's a territory in the mind, it's a perception. If you can articulate that in a way you can deliver it consistently, why would you not want to make that central uh, or the driving force of everything that you do and everything that you say as an organization? And we found that articulating that was through a DNA, which I'm going to take you through in a minute. Um, but that DNA, which encapsulates the heart of what it is that you're promising your customers, what you stand for, and what you believe in, uh, it can drive all aspects of the organization from your corporate strategy to the, your people uh, and the culture of the organization to the internal communications that motivate them to the products or the processes and systems rather that enable or hinder them to deliver your promise to the products and services, which are the tangible end, which your customers customers experience to the external communications that support that and the actual experience and perceptions of your customers which in the end should also the what what you're trying to have them perceive you as a brand should represent the heart of what your dna is so this whole thing loops back in a circular fashion if you like so and we framed this within this what i would call very simple but powerful strategic uh, process, which we call the four Ds, because it represents the four Ds, discovery, definition, direction, and delivery. And this works across any kind of uh, process of uh, strategic development and execution of a plan. It doesn't have to be brand oriented, but uh, it really works. So a discovery is the process of understanding the current perceptions of your brand you know, what do people think of you? What are your key challenges? Where are your key strengths? Uh, how are you faring relative to your competitors? Uh, and understanding that, we found shortcuts to do that through qualitative interviews with stakeholders closest to the brand. You don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars in research to be able to understand that, or you do balance it, certainly with internet and desk research and quantitative research when you've identified key opportunities for your brand. Uh, but we would boil down our discovery into two, two or three or key insights, what we would call the kind of three truths or courageous truths of your brand. Uh, you know, what's your consumer truth? What's your brand truth? Um, what's the category truth? And it would lead into the definition stage, which was your DNA. Um, and the DNA is, if you like, it's your a genetic um, template for replicating desired consistent experiences, the heart of which is your promise. And the definition or your DNA would be developed collaboratively um, in, a, in the furnace of a DNA development workshop session, which we do today. Uh, and that would then inform the goals of direction phase, which is typically a strategic framework of which there are many different types, classically the four pillars one, uh, but there's also a rose petal one, which is basically a way of of simplifying and focusing a strategic effort with limited resources, what you choose to do and what you choose not to do. And the delivery phase was bringing in third parties as well as mobilizing your internal resources to maximize delivery of your promise. <clears throat> uh, why did I end up kind of forming? How did Dim Sum Strategy come together? Um, one of the earliest companies that I worked with and still work with here in, in Vancouver was this young YouTube company called Blue Man, um, fantastic group, only, only 12, 12 um, young individuals, the CEO was age 24, and they're basically a YouTube company that sell men's um, hair care products online, uh, manufactured off-site, distributed uh, in, in a virtual world. Um, and they were tremendously bright and smart. They're already doing multi-million dollar turnover after after three years. So they were successful and they were well-read and smart, um, <clears throat> but they didn't have the courage of their own convictions. Um, and they just required a, a strategic sounding board. And what surprised me when we got working together um, and then was that they were unaware of some of the fantastic strategic tools um, that existed already they'd never heard of. And they, these tools illuminated them and accelerated their learning curve so much but they wanted them quick and easy in bite-sized chunks. Tell it to me in 10, 15 minutes, Peter. I'll do the research. We'll experiment with it, and then we'll come back and we'll do it. And that's how 
dim sum approach came uh, came around. Um, on your hair and your soul, by the way, is their positioning expression that came out of the DNA development session. Uh, these guys are passionate about hair, and they they believe that that uh, you can enlighten and uplift your soul if your hair looks good, and they're probably right. So, and that's what stimulated the the, the production of the book. Um, that and me finally getting off my backside and writing it. Um, so let me start with one of the key things in the discovery process that uh, I think is one of the most important um, aspects to understand. I call them perceptual lenses uh, because it's most important, I think, because it starts with self-discovery. Ask the questions, how do we perceive the world as individuals, especially if you're a leader of an organization listening to this or part of a, a small executive leadership team? What are the biases that you bring in terms of uh, um, perceiving, collecting, and interpreting information that makes decisions for you. We all carry them, um, but what through what kind of lens are we viewing? Some kind of lenses are easy to relate to, but the ones that are most powerful, often we are, we're not really aware of, or we carry biases in interpreting them. So, you know, if we see the world through the, you know, the wizened eyes of, of a, a, an elderly warrior male, it's very different than seeing the eyes through the innocent eyes of a young, uh, playful girl, for example. Very obvious. Uh, in the current world that we're facing, in this age of disorder, as Deutsche Bank called it, I mean, we're we're seeing a, what a, a, a chaotic lens, a, a turbulent lens. If you're seeing uh, everything that we're facing at the moment, the global pandemic, of course, but the environmental crisis behind that a cultural identity crisis with Black Lives Matter and Me Too, the, uh, the recognition of, the, of, of diversity and gender equality, all of the fake news, everything is, is changing in, in this uh, turmoil world that we're learning to, do, to deal with. It becomes much easier to understand when you understand something as simple as the turbulence model. This is, uh, you, you may or may not be familiar with this, it's an Igor Ansoff model, but it's a super, wonderful, um, wonderfully simple way of looking at and ordering the world. And it basically says um, there are five levels of turbulence where one is low turbulence, everything in the world is kind of repetitive, it's familiar, it's predictable. If you're in a work environment, what you're doing today is the same as you did yesterday, and it's likely to be the same as it will be tomorrow. Uh, things are comfortable and predictable. That's a kind of T1 level. T5 is the exact opposite. Uh, I liken this, T5 is totally unpredictable, except potentially after the event. If you use the analogy of a river, T1 and T2 would be a slow moving, meandering, old oxbow lake type river. T4 and T5 is white water rafting. T5 is going over Niagara Falls. And some people enjoy that and other people do not. If you take the concept of being comfortable at lower levels of turbulence, I think you like things predictable, you like things ordered and fashionable, you don't like surprises, you'd be a T1, T2. If you were somebody who likes breaking glass and challenging convention and constantly changing things, you're probably likely to be a T4, T5. And certainly in the advertising world environment that I used to work in, it was T4, T5 quite intensely but you can't sustain that too long. You need to rest. You've got to pull out. If you're constantly battering white water, you need to pull into the side sometimes to recover. So what happens if you put a T1, T2 person into a T4, T5 environment? It's a rhetorical question, so I'll answer it myself. There's huge anxiety and discomfort and a, a beam me up, Scotty, get me out of here. Uh, similarly, if you put somebody who, who loves change and drives it and wants, thrives on energy and constant change and, and innovation, uh, and you put them in a T1, T2 environment, uh, they are so bored, they plot revolution or they change. Either way, it doesn't work. Now, when you think about the conditions that we're in within the world at the moment, what kind of level is, of, of turbulence is the world? It's probably in T4, T5, the rate of change of acceleration 
uh, or acceleration of change and uncertainty is, is, is increasing as we come along. I mean, the last time world wars are hugely turbulent. Uh, but the, the upside of that is it's, it's the most opportune time for creating dynamic change in a positive way. And the solutions in turbulent times is to have a compass more than a map and to look for creative solutions thinking rather than logical or rational. So uh, here's another lens, generational lens. I'm not gonna spend too much time on because everyone gets that with the generations that it's, it's easier to understand that, that you know, even though they are generalizations, cohorts think largely in, in the same way. So my parents think very differently from my generation and very differently from my children's gener generation about uh, food, for example. Uh, my parents were post World War II. They were in food rationing. They never wasted a single thing on their plates. They carried that through. So me, uh, my children in, in the privileged, you know, North American world, order what they want in from home as if it was a restaurant, and and don't eat it all. It's it's kind of sinful. Um, but some of the other tools we're not aware of. Some of you may be aware of. Uh, this is uh, the Herman Institute's whole brain thinking, which is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, Ned Herman founded this in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, he was a fascinating guy. He was a physicist and he was the senior um, developmental uh, manager for General Electric. And he was charged with the task of how do we get more efficient use out of the best brains within the general uh, GE network who are very forward thinking. And he was into neuroscience. He was a physicist and he was also an artist. And he was fascinated by the different responses that people had to the same painting, very different responses. And at the same time, he was exploring work um, that, that Sperry was doing on split brain, left brain, right brain work. And, and also imposed the thought of the um, frontal uh, neocortex intellectual processing brain against the the, the primitive um, triune brain if you like uh, so the the limbic system the automatic intuitive fight or flight mechanisms of the brain and produce this metaphorical model of the brain which has turned out to be incredibly accurate and over 40 years has been developed into the HBDI um, Herman brain uh, dominance index uh, which you can see here uh, on the right uh, gives an indication of an individual's preference. It basically breaks your thinking up into four key patterns. So your, your frontal left is uh, analytical. Um, it's That's quantitative organized. You like things in, in short bullet points. You're financially geared and oriented. Um, you, you're maybe technically oriented. You like things brief. Uh, in, in the green lower left quadrant, left brain, it's the organized procedural safekeeping, uh, everything in its place and a place for everything kind of world. In the red bottom right quadrant, it's interpersonal. It's about empathy, communication, spirituality, uh, being intuitive, having gut feel. And in the, the upper right, it's more the uh, intellectual creative conceptual synthesizing, being able to see the bigger picture, uh, predict the future, challenge conventional wisdom, take calculated risks. And we all have elements of each four of those, but there are very marked thinking biases. And when you understand the perceptual lens that you as an individual process information, and then as a team process information, it has a profound impact on how you work with others, how you collaborate, how you communicate, and how you make decisions, not only for building brands, but for your business. Again, I haven't got time to go into that in depth, but a fa fascinating lens. Uh, so three reasons why brands fail. Back to promises again. They either make irrelevant promises, broken promises, or inconsistent delivery of your promises. Uh, it's pretty basic. That's all you do. I mean, irrelevant promises, uh, you may not think you're doing this. We worked with a telco company um, who prided themselves in the technology that they, that they had the, um, uh, the, the most effective uh, um, transmission. So no problems with, uh, with transmission. 
But what they didn't realize was that wasn't relevant to their customers because they attributed that to the hardware of the phone, not the service provider. And it was not competitive. They didn't see a difference. In fact, what they related to was the impact of being communicated to. So for them, it wasn't a relevant promise. Um, broken promises, <laughs> the, the world is littered with broken promises. Uh, I mean, I use examples of real life examples. I won't name the names, not to embarrass them, but these are large international uh, organizations, a bank that uh, you know proclaims, you know, we look after you, we look after our people, um, at the same time as reporting a billion dollar profit, lays off 200 of its people uh, to retain that billion dollar profit. The airline that says, come fly the friendly skies, when simultaneously they're voted the rudest airline in the world, uh, it, it, you think it's you, you're making it up, Peter, but I'm not. Um, you must be able to deliver against your promises. An inconsistent delivery of promises is an obvious one as well. We all have a favorite restaurant and a favorite dish. When you go into your favorite restaurant and they've changed the chef and they no longer have your dish anymore, mm. what what's the point? <laughs> I'll, I'll go somewhere else. Um, so the brand DNA is. Uh, I, I like the concept of uh, lighthouse brands. You know what you stand for, where you are, uh, and in times of turbulence and change, it's ever more so important to be anchored, uh, but also to be able to capture the richness and diversity of what you are. Brands are complex things like people, uh, but you need a way of being able to identify that complexity and articulate it in a way that you can replicate. Uh, and this is what we did with our DNA. The, the, the five key components of, of a DNA were the promise, the benefit, the spirit, the attributes, and the role, the reason why you exist. So your promise is your overarching commitment to your, that you make to your stakeholders that creates an expectation that you have to fulfill. The benefit is what they derive from you delivering against your promise. The spirit is the way in which you go about that, the distinctive characteristics, how you go about doing things, your culture. Attributes are things like icons that you can either create or along the way have become resonant with what you stand for. And the role, the why, before Simon Sinek brilliantly marketed it, we were doing this 25 years ago, is what you believe, what you really stand for, the role that you play in stakeholders' lives and why you do it. Uh, and if if you can articulate uh, a promise that is relevant, that's differentiating, that's compelling, and that is above all credible that you can deliver against, you will build successful brands. It's as simple as that. Um, I've just given you one example here now. It's hard to do justice in one single page, but this was for Shangri-La. They came to us looking to expand their franchise out globally when we were based in Hong Kong um, because we were guaylos then or seemed to be foreigners. They thought we would better relate to what they thought they needed, which was to reflect the North American experience where they were actually ironically expanding into Vancouver amongst other places. And they were looking at the um, the Hyatts and the Hiltons and seeing this very masculine, you know, green marble and brass type thing and looking to kind of replicate that. Um, so, well, of course, we came back to them and said, that's not what you are at all after having done the discovery work. You are feminine, you're graceful, you're dependable, you're enchanting, you're warm. In fact, you know, your promise is, is time-honored Asian values delivered in a contemporary way. And you've got these wonderful icons, Chang Sams and, and Candle Arbors, and you mix it with fine uh, Asian art, but in a contemporary way, uh, you make people feel at home. And of course, you know, that's you, that's Shangri-La. And people will come to you because of that. You don't want to attract the people that want the Boston masculine experience of brass and marble will go there and that's fine, but be who you are and be strong. Change, let's talk quickly about that. Um, uh, we've got another uh, 10 minutes or so before I, I stop. So I've got a few things I'm gonna fly through them a, a little quicker. Yeah, we have 10 to 15 minutes with us. So let's uh, catch up on the slides. Right, yeah, that's uh, that before we can stop for questions, okay? Yeah, um, yeah. So, and guys, make sure you put all your questions in the question section. You would not want to miss, uh, we would not want to miss any questions of yours. So yeah. please make sure you put your questions there. Yeah. Uh, we're all dealing with change. Most of us, I've found in my um, 
a lengthy experience of managing change now is we believe, and we still have to believe, that we can influence change uh, in a predictable manner, like uh, the process of a pupa coming into a chrysalis and a chrysalis emerging into this wonderful butterfly. And that does happen sometimes, but in my experience, it's not the majority of the times. Uh, <laughs> the majority of the times, it's one of these two processes of, of change. This is <laughs> the shocking one. It's an attack from a great white shark from deep waters. You don't see it coming. You're the seal. You get your flippers ripped off and you're bleeding and dead in the water before you know it. Um, and sorry if that's brutal, but that is the change that happens to more organizations and brands than they would know. The second one is, is this guy. Um, you know, he may look really cute. Um, but actually, this is, you know, being, being eaten, gnawed to death by hamsters is what I call it. He's actually licking you, soffing you, eating you from the fingers up. And this is the process of attrition and denial and bureaucracy. And we see this so often, especially in large organizations, too large to fail, automotive industries, Daimler Chrysler, educational industries, you know, universities are facing this now with mooches and online courses, uh, an inability to change. So many classic ones that you're aware of, Blockbuster, you know, Kodak was one of my clients. Uh, they came to me um, and they had their latest technology then, which was called Advantix. And, and I said, well, what's the idea? And they said, well, look, it's this, Basically, we're minimalizing um, all the images on one image so that you can select from these little images which ones you want. But they were still then processing it out in hard copy photographs on, on you know, silver nitrate paper. And, I, and digital had been around for a number of years. I said, guys, why aren't you doing this in the digital format? You know, we were the agency that had given you keep it with Kodak. And the idea was keep your memories with Kodak. It doesn't matter how the, those memories are delivered digitally on a, on a monitor or on a, on a photograph, which was disappearing. And uh, the regional guy said, Peter, I hear you, but you don't understand our organization. You know, we're, we're centuries old and our profit is driven by the sales of silver nitrate into the distribution network to process. And, and they, they had a, a vested interest to stay in there when they went. I said, well, you know, what's happening? Of course, they die a slow death being eaten, eaten nor to death by ounces, and nobody keeps it with Kodak anymore. So here's a very simple change model, which is, you know, um, you know I, my clients have told me, gosh, I get this. It's really simple. Don't, don't get confused by it. Just look, focus where the little the red dots are at the moment there. This is... Um, uh, uh, a, a, a Ron Cap Capaccio a model. And again, it's been around for 50 years. So you may have seen it, but many people haven't. You need four things to create change. Pressure for change, direction for change, capacity for change, and actionable first steps. And if you have all of those, you can have successful change. But if you're missing any one of them, it, there's frustration. So if you don't have pressure for change, it never gets started. There's, you know, it's bottom of the in tray, never even gets looked at. Um, if you don't have direction for change, you have a fast start that fizzles because you don't, all your energy is dissipated in multi different directions that doesn't have any impact. Um, and if you have uh, no capacity for change, that's probably the most frustration of all because you've got pressure, you've got direction, and you know first that steps, but you don't have the tools, the resource, the manpower, the finances to execute. And I've seen that many times as well. And the last one is if you have all three but no actionable first steps. It, that's also the most frustrating one because you have false starts that are haphazard and that fizzle out if you're not knowing where to start. You've got everything else. You must make start your journey. Every journey begins with the, the first step. Um, the delivery donut. Um, this was the tail end of it, if you remember, in the 4Ds. Uh, this was a simple tool to, uh, to, to give you a, uh, an idea of how to move forward. Um, so it, with six areas, with the brand DNA being your guiding lighthouse, as it were, the beacon that says this is what we stand for, that attracts that attracts the right brightly colored moths that you want, not everybody. Um, if that's at the center of your donut, it dictates everything that you do on the top, which is your product and services, your people who are key in delivering those products and services, and your processes, which are the main elements those are the things that enable or hinder you from being able to deliver those experiences. And across the bottom, 
your internal communications, your external communications, and your design, which is everything from advertising to visual identity. And all six of those contribute to delivering your customer perception. Importantly, we drew a distinction between internal and external communication uh, and the informal internal communication. If you can't persuade your own people that what you stand for is meaningful and changing people's lives and why you exist and, and in a way that, that is meaningful for them, there's very little chance you're going to do it externally. So start again and doing it with your internal first. Um, creative thinkers, it really helps to understand um, creative thinkers. And, and I understand that many of you are creative people with it. Um, and, uh, and, and so you'll relate to this completely. Uh, but many of the organizations and customers that I work with are not necessarily in the creative industries and they're calling in for creative advice because they're not. Uh, so it helps for them to think. And I say, look, you know, creative thinkers tend to challenge conventional wisdom. They break patterns of expectation. They disrupt. They're prolific. They have very many ideas. They produce multiple ideas and solutions. Uh, when they got ideas, they know how to separate idea generation from idea valuation, uh, and they know how to nurture them to give them the best chance to succeed. They ask better questions. They're not established by conventional wisdom or the established rules. They move around supposedly immovable objects, and they link unrelated thoughts to create new ideas. They create multi-sensory mediums. They suspend disbelief. They don't instantly jump to, no, we can't do that. They brainstorm effectively with others, and they tend to be risk takers. And if you match this with entrepreneurs, how they work, entrepreneurs are persistent and dogmatic, uh, and they experiment, and they treat failure as a necessary step towards success, and they're driven by what they perceive as success with their vision, not necessarily money. The most successful ones are not driven by money. Money is the is the is the result of them being successful and delivering their vision uh, so <clears throat> you will recognize this in yourself and in others how can you help create a more creative environment um, this is a, a, a simple two by two grid um, a great one from Norman Ashray and if you think of the axis the x-axis is psychological uh, uh, um, accountability rather and the y is psychological safety you want to create an environment where you can stimulate active growth by having high psychological safety, but also high accountability. And by that, I mean you're free to make ex uh, mistakes and experiment and take calculated risk within boundaries, but you're also accountable for it. You don't just have free reign or an open checkbook. You must be able to demonstrate some progress. Uh, we all know the organizations that preach innovation and risk taking, but and actually when you do fall flat on your face, you know, you're, you're booted out the door. Uh, there's so much hypocrisy and, and, and not delivering on that. But finding this and declaring this, what I call, you know, um, a safe zone uh, for between psychological safety and high accountability, simple model for creating more uh, uh, creative thought. So. You know, I talked about the age of disorder. That was Deutsche Bank's phrase for what we're moving into now. I prefer to think of this as uh, the age of creativity, where the solution lies to disruption and chaos. And we should be inspired and excited by the power of creative thinking. Um, we should learn to enjoy change, master it, ride the wave, and, and be what I call constructive disruptors. That's actually what I talk about. I'm talking about and dim some strategy in the book now because that was specifically what I would agree with Design Hill would probably be of most interest to, to you guys. But my, my passion is really in uh, constructive disruption, which is a, a combination of driving directed desired change through breaking patterns of expectation by zigging when others zag uh, and by developing targeted creative ideas through creative thinking. Um, and on that point, this is the challenge for the world. Um, this is a, a very recent search on Google Trends on people searching for creative thinking versus critical thinking. And the shocking thing is that there are six times more searches for critical thinking, which is that left brain, make it rational, make it logical, must be measurable, has to be tangible, end up in money, uh, typically, show me the procedure, I want the steps. 
and not the creative leaps or, or the emotional intuition or the things that don't necessarily have to be bound by logic, but are the things that ultimately create the transformational change that everybody else follows. Um, so there is definitely a gap um, where we can bring in and um, bring back more creative thinking. And I, I should say, I meant to say with the thinking model, no one thinking preference is better or worse than another. They're just different. And the concept of whole brain thinking is that as organizations, we should be developing whole brains so that there is a balance of each way of thinking, not necessarily within an individual. You should celebrate your differences and your core strengths. Uh, but as an organization, it should be balanced. Uh, so that's what I was saying. If you'd like to know more um, about creative thinking and constructive disruption, um, I'd be you know, happy to, to tell you a little bit more about that. It's Constructive disruption is like it suggests, it's about creating transformational change, but doing so in a constructive rather than a destructive way. Uh, and it's a combination of creative thinking, of breaking patterns of expectation, and creative ideas. Okay, thank you so much. That was where I was gonna end it. That's about, just about perfect timing to open up for some questions. Wonderful, thanks so much Ashwin. for the awesome presentation, Peter. Yes. Uh, yeah, so we have a we have few questions from the audience here. Uh, I'll do I'll, what I'll do is I'll put up these questions on the screen and you can probably answer all these questions, right? So let me start with the one which is asked by Ko. You will see the question on your screen and it says in terms of whole brain thinking, wouldn't it be the best to find associates working in the same quadrant as you reside in? So if you can answer Ko about that. Uh, it does It does depend on what you're doing. If you're, typically I would say most organizations, and it's been proven to show that if you have complementary skill sets and all those thinking preferences as an organization, you have a stronger organization. Uh, you can think about them as um, a, an emotional language or an understanding or as a vitamin. If you lack a vitamin C, you get scurvy after a while. If you lack an ability, for example, to have interpersonal skills, you may have the most brilliant creative ideas. You may know how to execute it in a business-like fashion, and you may have a fantastic process green to deliver it. But if you can't bring your people along because you've alienated them, or you've fired half of them, or they, they hate the way in which you do it, you don't, you don't have an organization. Uh, similarly, you could have the most brilliant idea. You could have people who absolutely love it, but no process for delivering it or executing against it. You're constantly living in the crowds. Or if you don't have your blue quadrant, you know, you can have fantastic ideas, process to deliver it, people who love doing it, but no financial acumen to make it sustainable as you go forward. So you need a mix. When it comes down to working with individuals, um, you tend to be able to naturally um, migrate to people who are like you. And that's fine within organizations. When you mentor people, you look to have complementary skill sets. Uh, but as a, as a leadership team, what happens is you tend to uh, um, accentuate the bias uh, of your leader. So if your leader is dominant in any one area, you tend to mirror and reflect that leader consciously or subconsciously. And those are where the dangerous biases come in uh, and, and where you need to actually create leadership teams with more balance. Hope that answers your question. Wonderful. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, this one is interesting. It is asked by Fadia and the question is on your screen. It says, how can a company adapting change but still stay true with its brand DNA? Well, bearing in mind your brand DNA is always future forward. So it's always a stretch. It's what you're desiring to stand for now and in the future. There should always be a stretch that you're reaching to. And it drives goals which are always, you know, visions which your fingertips reach out uh, into the future. So they're future oriented anyway. So there's never a conflict um, with your DNA and there should be scope to grow and develop within it. Um, but that said, uh, typically what happens is so, m many brands, if you are successful, sometimes stretch beyond their elastic limit um, and try and be something that they're not. 
that's when your DNA should be a check and balance and say, hang on, we're not, we're not this, you know, uh, we shouldn't go beyond it. I mean, Volvo and safety is the classic one I've used. They, they own safety and have done, but in, in the nineties, um, you know, they were doing all their research and looking at their square boxy cars and seeing that actually these smooth aerodynamic designs of Mercedes and BMW and Audi were researching much better. So they redesigned their cars to look more like that and came back and said, hey, we're stylish now. Said, no, you're not, you're Volvo, you're safe. <laughs> you know, those, that's just a hygiene factor now that, that you look the same. But so, yeah, again, hopefully that, that answers your question. All right. Uh, moving on to the next question. It is on your screen again. It is asked by Mark. And the question is, how can we maximize the benefit of dim sum strategy to enhance university branding to probably attract international students and faculty? Well, it's a great question. I mean, the first thing is to kind of go through the process. You need to do your homework. It doesn't need to take a long time. I'm doing one of these with uh, UBC at the moment. Um, I've done done ones for UBC. I've done for the, the School of Business, Saudi School of Business, BCIT, uh, other educational institutions, schools. Um, I sit on the board of CASE, so I'm familiar with the educational There's no shortcuts. You need to understand really what it is that you stand for and discover the existing perception based on the history of how you were established, what your genetics are, what it is that you want to be, where can you where can you specialize in. Too many universities I've found try and be all things to all people instead of actually focusing on an area and dominating within that. And the way brands uh, develop and categorize, they, they, they diversify into more specialized things like leaves on a branch um, rather than the general generalized ones. Um, so go through the process, do that discovery, define your DNA, and and it, you know, part of that DNA is what stands you apart, what differentiates you, what's your unique culture, how do you do things within your university, what's your unique promise, and that begs the question: to whom? Within you know practical segments, who are you targeting? Are you really specialising in medical or bio research or tech or sociology or which area is your real strength? And you'll find when people look at universities, they don't look at the whole university. They look at your department and they see where your department stands in the global rankings of, um, you know, physiology uh, or, uh, or law or uh, teacher training or nurse training or whatever. Does that, okay. Yeah. So the next question is again by Mark and again, a very interesting question on your screen. Customer experience is crucial for brand DNA and for the strategy itself. How about employee experience? How can we use dim sum strategy to convert our employees willingly as brand ambassadors? A great question. These are really good questions. Uh, um, as I showed you in that delivery donut, um, and I should remind you, this is only a very small fraction of those tools that can help. So there are other tools in there that would help you. but. Um, the internal communications and driving change through your people comes first <laughs> before driving your customer experience. Um, they won't necessarily always be or fit into your custom profile, but they should be believers in what you're actually do doing with. So you start with your, your customers uh, as, as you know, a primary um, believers in what it is that you're doing. And, and uh, I, I, so many organizations don't, don't think it that way or don't believe that way. And um, so, you know, the, the employee experience um, is driven ultimately by you, you, yours, obviously, what, what you're doing if you're producing a brand or service, you need to be customer oriented. And the whole premise of marketing is that you're based around customer orientation. Um, but involving and engaging your employees in, in believing the purpose of what it is you're doing uh, and having a say in shaping it so that they're customer oriented, that's how you engage your, your employees if what you're doing or producing isn't directly relevant to your, your, your uh, employees. All right. So one last question by Kohio, uh, again on your screen. It says, I generally call left brain thinking physical thinking versus right brain thinking, which I can relate to the to be more spiritual. Would you agree on that? Um, 
<laughs> Again, all of these generalizations can be a little, little over generalized. Um, you know, left brain, right brain is, is itself a simplification. You know, a, a four quadrant model is still a simplification, but it's more sophisticated than left and right. Um, uh, the spiritual thinking is very much a basal right um, uh, 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 phenomenon, if you like, and it's very. Um, recognizable and thinking the physiological one or the physical one um, all parts of the, of the brain can actually are malleable on that I wouldn't necessarily honestly um, agree with you I don't want to disagree either the spiritual is definitely on the right side of the brain and is more intuitive um, the physical practical technical um, rational logical side is more left-brained um, if you look interestingly around um uh, some of the work of ian mcgillchrist uh, they do fascinating work on right and, and left brain and basically the right brain the creative side or the intuitive side is what he calls the master and controls the whole the left brain is the more detailed order um and actually, so he uses an analogy of a bird pecking at seeds on the ground. The left brain is pecking on each little seed. Um, the right brain sees the fox, you know, cheeping around the corner and triggers the fight or flight, sees the bigger picture. So, I mean, there are many ways of cutting it, but that's how I see it more. I think there is increasingly, we have rewarded left brain thinking in terms of the way we reward money, order, um, goal orientation, all the classic kind of um, corporate type of goals are more left brain biased than right, but we're seeing the new era of right brain creativity and the Silicon Valley is a very much a different type of order of organization and brand thinking. Uh, you need both, you need the whole brain to succeed and one is not better than the other, but you need a balance. Uh, my own feeling is that the balance needs to switch, switch back a little bit um, and, and we need to celebrate our creative side all right uh, that was the last question of the session and all those who are wondering about uh, the certificates and the recording you will receive the recording of the session right after this webinar uh, in your inbox and uh, you will receive that certificate within one week of the session in your email again so um, that's uh, just wanted to answer that question who had uh, who put this question in the question section so uh, that brings us to the end of this wonderful session. Uh, this was indeed a value-packed session. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Once again, I would like to thank Peter for taking out the time to be a part of this event and sharing such insightful information. Peter, uh, any any last thing that you would like to say to the audience? Well, no, I'm, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you if you are interested. In finding out more, I can see there's many questions that I could answer that I couldn't. What questions can you ask in the discovery phase? A lot of them are in the book, and I'm not trying to vlog the book, for it, but um, um, if you are interested in finding out more, go to my speaker website, which is uh, peterwilkin.com, and I, I think um, you're, you're going to share a link for that, are you? Yes, yes, I'll share that. It's in the chat. Uh, it, it will be in the chat soon. So, uh, all right, guys, this is not where it ends. I have a few more things to share with you. To know more about Peter, as Peter just talked about, if you would like to connect with him and visit his website, you can connect uh, to him by visiting www.peterwilkin.com. The link will be in the chat soon. Secondly, Peter has arranged some discounts just for you guys on his book, Dimson Strategy. You can avail a 40% discount on hardcover and soft cover edition. This is exclusively for you guys. Uh, please note that the discount is valid only for 24 hours and it is not available on Kindle edition as they don't provide it. So use code DIMSUM, D-I-M-S-U-M, to avail 40% discount. Uh, I'm sharing all this in the chat. All right, it's right there in the chat. So use these links. Um, um, to avail 40% discount on Peter's book. Thank you so much, Peter, for arranging us exclusive uh, discount for the audience. Well, yeah, I do apologize. I can only do it through the American publisher and they still charge extortionate fees for shipping. You might find, uh, you know, Amazon is just as good, but at least for some in North America, and uh, that might be a benefit. And who knows, try it in Asia um, uh, and the UK. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't offer, uh, offer more, but... 
that's that's perfect in fact uh, it should help at least some people there so uh, thank you so much for that also um, a lot more events are lined up like this if you guys are interested and haven't registered yet uh, the link of the event section will be in the chat section you can just visit designer.com slash event to find out more such events like this and register for the upcoming session also you can find the recording of the session on our events page and on the youtube channel that we are going to upload soon there for all the business owners who are listening to this and wish to source high quality designs and uh, if you want to build your brand you can visit designer.com also this uh, the thing that i uh, spoke about earlier which was about the exclusive coupon code that we wanted to share with you you can use ps PW15 uh, as a code which you will also receive in your email to avail 15% off on print shop merchandise which is valid till 17th of April. So um, make sure you visit website and avail these offers uh, because it is exclusively for you guys. On that note, uh, I would like to say bye to everyone who joined us here today. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Peter, once again for joining us and again the audience uh, for joining us. I hope you had a good time and I hope to see you guys again in the next session. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>